Does anyone know any new news about COVID? Any new strains? <laughs> there is a new strain. Does anyone know what the name of the strain is? There is a new strain called Delta Cron. <laughs> so, any ideas how a new strain of virus emerges? Mutation is not how a new strain emerges. Mutation is how a virus accumulates some kind of variation and thus it continually infects the population. A new strain typically happens when one person is infected with two different viruses and the viruses exchange their genetic information. Okay? Is that when both viruses attack the same cell? And then yes, if they infect the same human, they will be you know, inadvertently infecting the same cell and they can exchange their genetic information. So that makes a recombinant virus or a new strain. Right? And uh, so those are the two main ways that viruses evade your immune response. It's also why the flu now is also starting to peak, right? Every year you should get immunized with the flu because a virus slightly mutates. Does everyone know how often a flu pandemic happens, like the swine flu or the avian influenza? Because it kills a lot of people. Every five years or so, five to ten years, you will see an epidemic of the flu, right? And every 10 years or so, you'll see some mild pandemic occurring. Okay? Good. All right, so we spoke about infectious disease. Who wants to define infectious disease again? Go on, give it a go. How would you define this? Good. Varun, do you want to clarify what type of transmission are we talking about? Good, that's type of transmission, but when I say infectious disease, I'm looking for horizontal transmission, right? Because vertical transmission is what you all learnt over the past modules, like genetic diseases, autosomal dominant, etc. Now we're talking about horizontal transmission across between individuals, right? Good. And Guy Three, what's another key point about infectious disease? We said it could be transmitted, but what do we call the causes, the causative organisms or entities for infectious disease. Um, the fact that it caused due to infectious agent. Good. They are caused by infectious agents, but there's another word I want you to use. Oh, TV's not Yeah, just give me 10 minutes. Good. All right. Okay, so the next component is it's caused by a pathogen, which is an infectious agent. Those are the two things I want you to remember. Now, how about the definition of disease? How do we define it? Safia, how would you define disease? Come on, guys. Ask your question, quickly unmute and answer. Uh, Lookman, could you define disease for us? Uh, the disruption of homeostasis. Good. Disruption of homeostasis. And Lookman, what is homeostasis? The internal balance of our body. Very good. Perfect. Good. Now that we've got the key points out of the way, we learned about prior diseases. But what are the key things you need to know about prior diseases? So this, just to give you perspective, is you learn about pathogens and transmission. Pathogens, transmission is a first inquiry question. Then you learn about our response to this pathogen, so the immune response. And does anyone know what the last part of this module is all about? Think about it. We've spoken about the cause, your response, and good treatment. What else, Ria? Treatment and prevention. Anything else? Good control. Literally, that is the structure of this module. So everything you learned, everything you currently learn, I want you to put it under these categories in your head. Cool. Now, pathogens, we begin with the smallest pathogen and we work our way up. So the smallest pathogen, uh, let me ask, Pranam, what is it? And what do you need to know about it? 
for your tautology. Good? Before you tell me what primes are, for any pathogen for the syllabus, what do you need to know for your exams? Okay, so mechanism. Anything else? Mechanism of disease. Structure is so important. More important than mechanism. Mechanism, you can one liner and, and smash it. Structure is important. Why? What kind of questions would you get for structure? Electron microscope images, light microscope images, and you have to identify what the pathogen is. And you need to also be able to explain its method of reproduction. Method of reproduction. Okay. Good. What else do we need to know? Alyssa, what are some other aspects of pathogens that I need to know? Um, Georgina, what are some other aspects of pathogens that we need to know about? So we said structure, mechanism, reproduction. What else? Yep. Um, maybe if it's cellular. Yeah, good. That's mentioned in the syllabus, but that's about structure, right? Is it cellular pathogen? Is it non cellular? Safia? How they transfer the disease? How they transmit disease. Okay, so how they are transmitted. All right, that's important. What else? Daipu, what else do we need to know? Um, maybe the virulence factor, like how it adheres to the host cell. Yeah. Other thing I'd say is you need to briefly know examples. Okay. Key thing would be structure, transmission, examples. You know those three things, I'm happy. Structure, transmission, examples. Make sense? What does it look like? How does it spread? What's an example? Good. Let's start with primes. So I'm going to point at one of you. You need to tell me structure, and then transmission, and then examples. One person does one part, okay? Martin, what's the structure of a prime? What does it look like? Pick some. Priya, what does a prime look like? Need more detail. You guys, it's like saying, you know, a human does not have eight limbs, right? True. But what is it? What is a human? What is a prion? It's a protein. That's what I want to hear, right? A prion is a protein. Where is it found? In the cell membrane. We're talking about human cells here. There is no cell wall. The reason you need to know that is because all of you will be taking antibiotics at some point in your life. Antibiotics kill the bacterial cell walls. They don't hurt us because we don't have a cell wall. Does that make sense? Basic understanding of cells helps us save lives. Good. So there are proteins found in cell membranes. If I were to draw it for you, have they're found normally in this shape. What shape is this? Good. They're normally found in an alpha helix shape. But what can they misfold into? Beta shape, right? Now my question is, how do they misfold? Can we give it a go? Think about a protein. How would a protein change? What are the two differences? I think mutation. Mutation, right? So the main way these primes can change is spontaneous. And that's scary, right? Think about this. This means the primes in your brain, just due to random mutation that you got in the sun radiation, can spontaneously become prior disease. Very, very rare. If it does, you will get prior disease. So all of you, including me, have a small chance of developing spontaneous prior disease. Okay? Good. So spontaneous by mutation of our prion gene, right? Prions are proteins, they're encoded for by genes. What's another way? Uh, 
let me ask Safia, what's another way that prions can cause, can misfold? You said spontaneous, what's another way? Um, I don't know, sorry. All right. I, okay, when I ask you guys a question, I want you to logically think about it. I don't care about your answer, right? I'm not looking for right or wrong. This is in class. I want critical thinking here. So I want you to tell me your stream of thought. These are proteins. I've said they can spontaneously misfold. What else can change a protein? See, even though he mentioned transcription translation, that was not the case. I liked his line of thinking. I want a line of thought. Push your turn. What is another way a prion can misfold? I know you can read off your notes, but what's another way? You should look up at me. So prions are proteins made by genes. Where do your genes come from? DNA. Yeah. Where did they come? Where did that DNA come from? A zygote, and who contributed to that zygote? Where did the spermatozoa and ova come from? Good. So what can you tell me? If prions are encoded for by genes that come from your parents, don't you agree they can also be inherited? Good. See, what a lot of you guys are doing is, I understand you're on holidays, but if you come into class without revising, then it's just you're repeating the same thing you learned last lesson. Okay, so I want you to make sure you've taught this stuff to yourself before you come into class. Good. Uh, Tanisha, what's another way? We're learning infectious disease. What's another way that can be transmitted? We've spoken about genetic mechanisms of transmission. What else? By consuming it. Okay. Good. So, like, if, so that's very specific. Very specific. You can. Uh, consumption of infected tissue. I would say they can be transmitted through contact, right? Specifically, it could be both direct or indirect contact. So I'm going to write contact. So they can be direct contact or indirect contact. Direct, indirect. But just remind us, what is direct, what is indirect? Direct is the physical contact. Yeah, or? Or okay. uh, fluids, right? So the direct physical touch of another organism or contact with their body, right? What is indirect contact? Everything else, right? Good. So an example of direct contact is consumption. So certain individuals have gotten prion disease from eating beef. So if you're going to McDonald's eating a beef burger, the beef has mad cow disease, which is a type of prion disease, and a human will develop a variant form of CJD, which is an example of a prion disease, right? Good. What are some other ways? Surgeries as well. Has anyone donated blood before? One of your holiday bowls, go donate blood. You get free food, right? <laughs> get a milkshake, you get unlimited chocolate candy. You save three lives. You come out feeling good and you feel good because you ate. It's probably one of the coolest things you can do. So when you donate blood, one thing they'll ask you is, do you, have you had any brain surgeries or pituitary hormone replacements from 1980 to 2000? And that was a time where they didn't screen for prion disease or didn't sterilize equipment, so there was a rapid spike in prion disease, right? So it's to remind you that indirect contact can be through surgical equipment. Surgical equipment that's being contaminated. Now, no, you don't know all of this as long as you can tell the examiner infectious transmission and mutation and inheritance, you're set. All right, we're going to move on. When a prime misfolds into a beta sheet configuration, why is that bad? What does it do? Korea? When it misfolds, what's the effect? Yeah. I like that long line of thought, right? But what else? So prions function, we don't really even understand that, but we think it's because it protects against free radicals, which are molecules that damage DNA. Okay, so a bit more DNA damage. There's a really bad consequence. This is where you need to remember domino effect, right? When one prion misfolds, it will bind to another prion and force it to also misfold. Kind of like a domino, it's going to force the adjacent one once it's fallen. 
Okay? And what that does is it forms this long chain of iron proteins that are toxic to the brain. Kind of think of it as a long chain that's going to stab holes in the brain. Okay? So you end up with a spongy form pattern of disease. Make sense? What's an example of prion disease? Brain. Now you're telling me structures that are affected by prions, but what's an example of prion disease? Alyssa, your turn. You didn't answer the previous question, so you must answer this. This is your warning to do so. What? Oh, sir, I think her mic's not working. Oh, I am so sorry. I apologize. I think you messaged that as well, didn't you? Oh, thank you. Okay, I can't see... Actually, I'll keep the comment section open. How about that? I'll go back to that. All right. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, let's go back to... Uh, Victoria, what's another example of prion disease? Um, not too sure. Okay, so one example is Kuru, right? It's one you should remember when uh, tribes in New Guinea uh, consumed their ancestors, right? And when they consumed the meat or the brain tissue of infected individuals, they also got prion disease. Good. How does it present prion disease? How would you know if you're a doctor and a patient comes in front of you? When would you be concerned about prion disease? Symptoms. symptoms is, that's medicine. You study symptoms, right? Dementia, memory problems. That's typically how it starts, and it can progress to a lot of weird things, movement disorders. Just think about this you're damaging the brain. What does the brain do? Helps you think, helps you remember, helps you move. All those things get affected. Okay? Good. Guys, whoever's mic doesn't work, can you maybe. I know you can hit emojis. Can you maybe do a... Can you emoji react? Yeah. Can you emoji react with a... a heart? I don't know if that stays though. Does it? Yeah. Let's see, do you mind maybe just hitting the, the heart react sign? Just so I remember as well. Oh, it doesn't stay. That's all right. Okay, that's right. So anyone else whose life doesn't work, can you just comment it down because we don't want to ask that case. But all right, cool. Good. We understand everything about prions. What's the second biggest pathogen for prions? Good, right? Tell me the structure of a virus. What does it look like? So looking under a microscope. What is its structure? Try not to look at your notes. Does it have genetic material in it? Good, right? And what is that genetic material typically? DNA or RNA? Uh, which is RNA. Good. Well, most viruses are RNA viruses, yeah. right? Now, you have something as important as DNA. What would you like to do? If you are holding your most valuable possession, would you hold it out or would you protect it? Good. What can you use to protect it? Good thought. But remember, viruses are cells, right? So we simply use a protein capsid. Protein capsid. I like that line of thinking, but it's better than an I don't know. Good. All right. So we've got RNA, we've got a protein capsid. Now, what's outside of this protein capsid? Any ideas? They're not cells, so they don't have organelles. No organelles in the virus. Okay, that's why they need us. That is why they're not cells. Does that make sense to everyone? If they had their own organelles, they'd need to infect humans. For one second. In the meantime, I'd like you guys to think about what the other components of the virus are as well. Yeah, I will um what I can do is look at the uh 
Spoken about the structure of virus, genetic material would need a protein capsid. Now, viruses also need their own proteins to start using your organelles. Okay, so what we call what we call that is a bunch of viral proteins, collectively called the viral tegument. All you need to know is viral proteins also exist outside. Does anyone know what the main viral protein is? This is important because antivirals directly attack these viral proteins so a virus cannot replicate and grow. What is the main viral protein? This is a cure to HIV or the treatment for HIV. This is a treatment for influenza, treatment for Ebola, treatment for all the... It's the reason we can cure hepatitis today. Look, man. What is the main viral enzyme? Uh, reverse scriptase. Good. Close reverse transcriptase. Oh, right? whoops. <laughs> and to answer that question, I'll show you the line of thought you should have had. A virus has RNA. It needs to use host cell DNA to replicate its genetic material, right? It needs to use DNA polymerase in your cells. Imagine you're infected with COVID. COVID's an RNA virus. It needs to use your DNA polymerase. It can't because DNA polymerase will not act on COVID RNA. The so COVID is so smart, it has a little package called reverse transcriptase. What is transcription, Martin? What to what? DNA to mRNA, right? DNA to mRNA is transcription. What is reverse transcription then? So it converts the COVID RNA to DNA, so it can sit in your DNA polymerase, copy itself, replicate it on times, burst out of your cells, and cause you symptoms. Does that make sense? Good. The reason you know, you need to know this, especially if you're in science, is a lot of the medications we give patients, antivirals, target these enzymes. Okay? Does that make sense? Good. Reverse transcriptase, you should know that. All right, and outside, is a cool thing when a virus bursts out of your cells, it rips part of the phospholipid bilayer of the host cell. So, some viruses are what we call enveloped, right? Where they're packaged in a phospholipid bilayer. Good. Structure is so important. All right, cool. What's an example of a virus? And how is it transmitted? <laughs> Other than COVID. That doesn't show any biology understanding, right? Because it's everyone knows about COVID. So never say that in your exams because you might not get a mark. Good. Give me another. Yeah, HIV. Very good. How is it virus? You don't need to know that it's RNA or DNA. That's, yeah, even I don't know all the RNA or DNA viruses. This is an RNA virus, HIV. But uh, tell me how it's transmitted. Uh, Good. Does everyone see how we split it up? You need to always say that it's indirect, direct, or this third category. What is that? Sorry, I've forgotten to. All right, what I might quickly do is I'm going to give you guys a question, only because some students are having difficulty accessing the class. Um, could you give this question a go? And we'll then come back and go through this instead. Can you get my phone? 
I got the question. Good. We've gone through a bacteria as well. Have I gone through bacteria with you guys? Yeah, I've been through this. You can, yeah, you can answer the rest of this actually. That's all you need. Um, Thank you. 
Now, this is an important question because this is literally what we do as doctors. And we suspect the viral illness when we order these exact tests. And I wanted to see whether you guys understood why we would, according to your basic biology understanding. So, anyone know any blood borne bacterial infections? Does anyone know what we call blood borne bacterial infections? So typically, emia means blood. So bacteremia is infection of the blood. And that can happen if you have a dental procedure. Has anyone had a dental checkup done recently? Yeah, when they go through your teeth and they make your gums bleed, a bit of bacteria from your mouth go into your bloodstream. So sometimes you feel a bit sick after that, right? Have you ever had a sepsis before? With sepsis? That is also a severe blood infection where you have an abnormal body response as well. Key point here is bacteria and viruses can infect your blood. So we would do a lot of these things. Microscopy, culturing the blood, and then PCRing, looking for any viruses. Kind of gave it away. All right. Starting with A, if we microscopy, can we see a virus on light microscopy? No. Viruses are subcellular. You can barely see the nucleus of a cell in light microscopy, right? We don't electron microscopy uh, every single... We don't electron microscopy in health, full stop, unless it's for research purposes, okay? Good. What about growth in a Petri dish with nutrient agar? What would you see for a bacteria, Pranav? What would you call that? I think there's some buzzwords here. Bacteria, virus, you'll be able to see it, can't see it. Bacteria, virus, what's your answer? Macrocolonies, right? So you would have cultured it and you would be able to culture it and you'd see macrocolonies growing in the ava. Good. What about for a virus? Dietary? What would you expect to see? If I smeared COVID-19 on a petri dish, put it in body temperature, uh, so an incubator, what would I see? I don't think I'll be able to see anything because it only reproduces inside a host. Very good. So a virus needs host cells to replicate. Does that make sense? So if there are no host cells, which is the case of the agar, right? agar is just a protein-rich medium derived from seaweed, okay? There's no actual cells in the agar. So viruses cannot be cultured. What I was testing here was whether you understood viruses need human cells to replicate. So if it was, like, if the blood was, if, like, if it was, like, if the um, virus was taken from the blood, would it appear in human cells because the virus would be in those human cells, in those red blood cells, is that what you mean? Typically what happens is when you set up a blood sample, the blood directly is not smeared, okay? Because then that's a confounding variable, because it's going to grow regardless. If you typically be centrifuge the blood, you can isolate different aspects and smear it. So the non cells are the Exactly why a virus would not grow in a culture. Otherwise it would grow in any culture, because if you do a cheek swab, it's going to get cheek cells. So the logic is whenever you culture it, you're using the pure pathogen from that culture medium. Very good logic of thought, though. So virus, you would see absolutely nothing. What about PCR for genetic material? Any ideas? Well, don't both of them have genetic material, right? But when you PCR, you can identify the specific genetic material because how does PCR work? How does it differentiate, you know, genetic samples? What is it based on? molecular mass, the size of the DNA, right? So viral DNA is typically much smaller than a bacterial DNA, right? But uh, the key point here is it would be able to distinguish viral and bacterial DNA. Um, both would be positive. Good. So if you got everything correct and you justified it relating it to the structure, then you got six marks. Does that make sense? So there are th six things to look at here. And if you linked it to structure, that's the six marks. Yeah. You have to mention I wouldn't say that's required, but it's good to be said. I like how you thought I learned this in mod five, I'm going to add it. It definitely is fair. And say after PCR, the DNA fragments are electrophoresed, since both of them have DNA or 
RNA, both of them will uh, appear as bands on electrophoresis. That's it. Very good. Good. Good job. All right. Let's come back to. We spoke about viruses. Now, very quick talk about bacteria. What is the structure of a bacteria? So, Safia, what can you tell me about the structure of bacteria? Unicellular. Very good. Good. What else? Do they have a cell wall or not, Safia? Pardon? Do they have a cell wall or no cell wall? Um, they do. They do. Good. Georgina, what's a cell wall made out of for a bacteria? Any ideas? I'm not too sure, but maybe, maybe protein. Good. Protein and glucose. It's a protein-based cell wall. Very good. Uh, Real, what's cilia and what's cilia? Cilia is the why do we have cilia room in bacteria? Has anyone been bouldering or rock climbing before? Uh, you guys should go see a few things to do in the holidays, right? Don't just study all the time. Uh, for bouldering, you need to wear specific shoes for traction. In the same way, these bacteria need to attach and have traction onto your cells to actually enter in or invade them. Otherwise, bodily fluids, coughing, will spurt them out, right? So cilia for attachment, for gela, for motility, which means swimming through the body. The body is 60% water, right? These are technically aquatic organisms. They look really weird. All right, very good. Okay, remember they also have one big chromosome, that's a circle, and then plasma DNA as well. Okay? Yeah, another very good point. Since they're prokaryotic, the only organelle they have are ribosomes. Ribosomes are the only ones that don't have a membrane over the surface of that organelle. Okay? Very good. Any questions so far? This is the basic ABCDs um, of understanding pathogens. These are the things that kill people, which is quite nasty. Has anyone seen sick people with bacterial or viral diseases? Yeah? Because it's hard for you guys to relate to this, but when I learn this stuff, you know, when I'm doing my exams, my goal is not, you know, to do all this to get a high distinction or distinction. It's that one day I'm going to have to use this, and that's going to be the delineation between someone surviving and not surviving, right? Just understand all of you, may have to use this as information for the same use case. Um, so this is really highlights that you shouldn't just be studying this because you want high marks and stuff. You should genuinely be interested in this because eventually, I promise you this, someone you know or yourself will be affected by this. And then it becomes all too real. All right. So bacterial diseases, you should also know the mechanism of replication. I'm just going to mention binary fission. Don't forget that. We'll come back to the different types of replication. Good. What's an example of a bacterial disease? Common things first. So what are some common bacterial diseases? Salmonella. Okay. So do you know what that causes? Because salmonella is the bacteria, right? So there is salmonella typhi, etc. That is a bacteria. What is the disease it causes? I'm going to teach you guys how to speak medicine. It's a whole other language. What organ does it affect? Yes. What else does it affect? If it affects the intestines, the intestines absorb water, so you don't absorb as much water. Diarrhea. What's the other symptom on the stomach bone? Vomiting, right? That's the stomach. It's pretty cool. If someone is just diarrhea, you know, okay, it's so mainly a disease of the small intestines, because I know what the small intestines do, they absorb water. But if someone's vomiting, I know there's also involvement of the stomach, right? When it's irritated, it will bring food back up. So we know that a stomach bug affects both. So what we call it, the disease is called gastro or stomach, enteric 
for the enteric system, which is your intestines. And what do we call inflammation? What do we end things off with when it's inflammation? Itis. Itis means inflammation. Hepatitis, inflammation of the hepatic system or the liver. Bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi. Right? You can, you can go with every single uh, structure. Medicine is not just fancy words. It's telling you what the disease is. As long as you try to understand the language, it makes much more sense. You don't need to memorize this, by the way. As long as you say salmonella, it's fine. But I want you to be a band six student or higher. The salmonella causes gastroenteritis. What's another one? A lot of people you know are going to end up coughing mucus, you know, in the next couple of weeks to months. Um, it could be the influenza, but it could be something a bit worse caused by a bacteria. What am I talking about? It's so common in the community. The flu influenza is the flu. It's a viral disease. And it infects the airways. But there is a bacteria that will directly go to the alveoli, which are the growth like sacs, and infect them. Pneumonia. pneumonia, right? Whooping cough is different. It's called by the tusks, right? So, bacteria that releases toxins in the trachea makes you cough. And you do a hoop to breathe in after the cough. So, it's called whooping cough, right? It's a very different type of disease that's seen in kids. Whooping cough is not as common in adults. The other disease I'll tell you is pneumonia. Pneumo means lung, right? Onia disease. So this is infection of the alveoli. What causes pneumonia? Way too hard of a question for your papers. Let me just tell you, it's streptococcus bacteria. You don't need to memorize the name either. Just say pneumonia is an example of disease. You get full marks. Okay? So I'm just giving you um, the cause of the age. Look at the question. Uh, what about tuberculosis? Uh, tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria as well. Mycobacterium tuberculosis. That one is really, really nasty. The reason it's so nasty is that if any of us gets TB, it's so infectious, so severe, that you will need to isolate for up to six months. If you thought two weeks isolation is bad, TB, you'll be put in a hospital and detained for six months, right? Because it's very infectious, and even treating it, sometimes it doesn't go away, right? So TB is a really nasty infection. In fact, um, I'm going to start working in the emergency department in the coming week, and for that, we need to be cleared for TB. So, doing all the blood work and tests, so there's no evidence we have TB because it can also be hidden and reactivate when you're sick or ill. So, TB is one of those nasty diseases. How does that affect the lungs? Yes, it directly affects the lungs, but it can affect a lot of the body. Similar to COVID, COVID does not just affect the lungs. We found that COVID kills brain cells, COVID affects the kidneys. It can put you into kidney failure. COVID affects the blood clotting system, puts you at increased risk of clots. COVID affects the liver, the heart, and cause myocarditis. COVID is not a lung disease, it's a whole body disease. It's just for lay people, you simplify it as the main organ is the lung. Okay? TB is similar to that. If it spreads enough, it goes everywhere. You go in the spine, the brain, really bad. Tuberculosis. You go to India, Asia, South Africa. This is rampant there and commonly occurs with HIV. HIV destroys the immune system, TB jumps in. Okay, it kills people that way. Good. All right, we'll move on. Let's talk about protozoa. What was the main protozoal disease you need to know about? Malaria. Pardon? Malaria. Malaria, very good. In the meantime, before we talk about protozoal diseases, I want you guys to plan your answer to this question here. It's a five mark question. And I want you guys to plan your answer to this one. Um, in the meantime, people
Okay. Yeah. What do we go with for this question? Uh, what disease did you pick for viral disease and uh, bacterial disease? This is important because the one you pick now, I want you to stick with that for the rest of the HSC exams. Okay. So what do we pick for virus? Anyone? What did you pick? HIV is a really good one to pick. I like it. It's very interesting. It is one of the craziest diseases. Uh, it was a pandemic at one point. It affected the whole uh, planet. And in the 1970s, it was an epidemic in Australia. It was like COVID, right? Now, what's the bacterial disease we use to our example? Pick one. We'll stick with it. Salmonella. Salmonella is a bit boring. It's a stomach bug, right? How do you treat it? Drink water. If it's really bad, hydrate. Intravenous fluids. In saying that, dehydration kills, right? So stomach bugs can kill, but salmonella is typically self-resolving. Zafia, question? Tetanus is an interesting one. Tetanus is really good because if you don't immediately give yourself passive immunization. If anyone has a rust or a metal injury, and you might know you need to go straight to the doctor to get a booster of tetanus, right? That's because it's not tetanus that kills. It's the toxin that tetanus has on metals that will kill. And that toxin binds to nerve cells, can cause paralysis, can cause muscle contractions. And let me just... Uh, I want you all, does anyone have their phone on them? Can you search tetanus patient and you will not forget how it looks. You will see a person with their back bent and contracted like they're having an exorcism. That's what happens if you don't treat tetanus. Right? That's what tetanus does. It causes muscle contractions because it affects the nerve cells and the muscles. Um, tetanus is cool, but uh, let me pick something interesting. I think, where's it cool? I think a really good one is uh, tuberculosis, right? We're going to say tuberculosis. Really nasty. I like learning the cool, nasty diseases that are really harmful for your health. All right. What are they caused by? HIV is caused by, it makes it very easy, the HIV virus. Human, and it, it's a bit redundant saying HIV virus because HIV means human immunodeficiency virus. So if you say HIV virus, it's the same virus twice. But we still say that. So it's caused by the HIV virus. TB is caused by bacteria. It's caused by a specific kind of bacteria called mycobacterium. Don't you know why it's called myco? It's because it has an acid called mycolic acid in its cell wall. But just know it's a special type of bacteria. What's the effect on the host? HIV. What does it do? You're explaining how the pathogen causes disease, right? This is what is the effect on the host? That is the symptoms and signs. Does that make sense? Good. What is the effect on the host? Uh, yeah, what is it? Yeah, symptoms and signs. So effect on the host is, I would say, for tuberculosis, it affects immune cells. Well, to make it simple, it infects lung and immune cells. Okay? And by infecting lung cells, specifically the alveolar cells, etc., it's going to cause respiratory symptoms. The key things we ask is coughing up blood in uh, TB. It's very good you pick that up. Coughing up blood. So I'm just going to close the door right now. We're concerned about TB. Medical students are typically, or doctors are typically asking about coughing up blood, night sweats, or chills. Those are the symptoms of TB. 
Um, you don't know all of them. Moving on, what about HIV? What does HIV infect? Any ideas? Look at them. Uh, yeah, so HIV infects T helper cells. Very good. It which... infects immune cells. Specifically, to put things in perspective, uh, in Australia we have police, right? New South Wales state has police. Police are like the immune cells. HIV, what it does, it goes and murders the uh, police superintendent or the chief of police. The T helper cell is the most important immune cell to your immune system. So if HIV goes head on and kills these cells, would you have a functional immune system? So what do you think would happen in terms of infections? You would get very sick and die from things like the cold, but even things as simple as bacteria that are on your skin right now, which typically cannot harm you, because first of all, skin is dead, but even if they enter in, your immune system will destroy it, now they can go rampant. You don't see Batman? Movie Batman? You guys remember the first scene where there's criminals all around Gotham City? That's kind of how it looks like with the body. All these bacteria, little, little bacteria go in and they cause havoc. Right? So you get all kinds of weird diseases you would never ever see a healthy person. We call those diseases the weakened immune system. And we call diseases that should not normally affect humans opportunistic infections. Opportunistic infections. Why opportunistic? Kind of like there are people in society that won't do any bad unless you know, there's a right and there's a huge you know, uh, disorder and chaos and then they can do mild robberies. Kind of like in the US. Did you guys see the Black Lives Matter protest? A lot of people use that as a front to also rob you know, convenience stores, all those kind of small things. Correlation I'm trying to draw, these are bacteria that are very weak and not harmful, but given an opportunity, aka in a weakened immune system, they will attack and do as much damage as possible. Okay? Good. All right. So basically the symptoms are anything. You can get any symptom based on the kind of infection you get in HIV. All right? Good. How do they cause disease? So how does a bacteria like tuberculosis cause disease? The issue is the vague points. How do bacteria cause disease, everyone? Lookman? Actually, Lookman, you've answered a lot. Uh, I'm going to ask Tanisha. Oh, Victoria, how do you think bacteria cause disease, Victoria? I just want any line of thinking, any logical thought. Any ideas on how bacteria cause disease? What can bacteria release, everyone? Toxins. So one way it can cause disease is, right, disease is through toxins. What's another way that can cause disease? They have cilia. What are cilia for? Attachment and also entering in, right? So they can enter and invade between cells and tissue. Some bacteria can go into human cells as well. Okay? So they can invade. That's the other thing, invasion. Some bacteria don't like going in cells, some do. It really depends on the bacteria. Tuberculosis, the reason it's so hard to treat is because it goes and hides inside cells. So even if you shoot, you know, antibiotics and all these nasty drugs, it's protected inside your own cells. So it kind of remains as well. Good. Any questions about tuberculosis? It affects lung cells, coughing up blood. Uh, it uh, invades and releases toxins. It more invades, but uh, you don't need to know which one is more prominent for diseases. What about HIV? How does it cause disease? Yeah, I would say that's too, it's using too many lay terms. Injecting DNA is very much a lay person's term you would use. What I would say is it uh, enters into host cells. And what does it use to replicate itself? And uses? That's its own enzyme, right? I want to know what host cell components it uses. As a marker in HC, I want to know what parts of the human cell is the virus using. Anyone know? 
Yes, to do what? Good. Transcription or translation? Translation, right? To translate into proteins? Because it's already RNA. It doesn't need a transcription. That's why it's RNA. What else does it need? DNA replication enzymes, like polymerase. To do what? Replicate? It's DNA. What is a virus essentially? It's DNA, code, and protein. Everything else is not needed, but it's present. Does that make sense? So for a virus to replicate itself, it needs your, it needs your ribosomes to make more of the viral protein, and it needs your nucleus and DNA polymerase to make more viral genetic material. Right? Those are two things I want to get. Yes. Come outside of the capsid. It has. This is the thing. We're making things so so simple with the static viruses. What actually happens the second it enters, there'll be chemical interactions and reactions with the capsid that will break it down, or there'll be chemical signals that the viruses evolve to pick up, so that the capsid opens up. So all of that's a very complex signaling pathway, and it's beyond the scope of it. But uh, simple answer is, it is so complex that our minds can't even comprehend. But where this is very simple stuff. It might seem tough to us because it's the first time we're learning it. But you know, you have to realize that what we're learning is the surface of the surface of the surface of what pathogens really are. Good. So then it uses that to replicate. Now, if I was marking this, I'd still take a marker. One. This is pretty much a perfect answer. I wouldn't even expect a student to know more than one symptom. I wouldn't expect the student to mention uh, specific enzymes. That might be important because you learned DNA replication. And I would not expect you to know specific names. Because even if you said tuberculosis, you would get the mark. So what are you missing? This is where you should know what your syllabus wants you to know and what it doesn't want you to know. Okay, so using comparative terms, let's assume we've done that. If you put a table, you've compared it. You didn't need to use comparative terms. If you just had headings in the table and you split it up, I'd give you four marks. What else? What am I missing? Code, I'd still not give you the marks. This is an issue, right? When you know a lot in biology, you know a lot, so you say extra stuff, but you miss some key stuff. What are we missing here? Look at Maybe how we can go on to transmit to other people. Yes, very good. When it was how a pathogen causes disease, do you all agree it's vague? It needs to first reach the host cells to cause disease. So you need to talk about transmission as well. Very briefly, what is the transmission of HIV? Direct, can be through blood. What else can it be through? Venereal uh, transmission. Venereal means sexually transmitted diseases. That's the main way HIV is transmitted, right? The reproductive tract of the female, the reproductive organs of the male, they contain a lot of mucus and a lot of cells that aren't protected, right? They're not layered like this keratin on the skin. So viruses and pathogens can easily move them, right? That is why a lot of sexually transmitted infections are viral, and a small portion of them are also bacteria. Good. So I would say HIV is transmitted by direct contact. I'm going to write that in red. Direct, and I'd mention sexually transmitted or bloodborne. Yeah. If I used a, a dirty needle from a friend and I injected myself and I got the disease, is that direct or indirect contact? Very good. So do you guys see how you can't, you seeing direct and indirect is a bit reductive as well. Because bloodborne, for example, it can be direct if someone has a blood wound and they touch, you know, a cut of your skin, which is very rare. But then it can also be indirect if they're sharing needles containing blood. Okay, so just know, sometimes types of transmission fall under both direct and indirect, depending on the specific circumstance. Just ask yourself logically, you know, is it direct or indirect? Good. What about uh, 
transmission of tuberculosis. Any ideas? So it can be direct through droplets. Pardon? Could it be direct through surfaces? Yeah, so it can be present on surfaces. You are right. So it's a droplet transmission. Um, this is the thing. If there are droplets on a surface, this is kind of the, it is technically indirect, but in your HSC, when you say the word droplet transmission, what the marker is thinking is droplets directly going onto someone. So just call it direct. Okay? You get where you're coming from. Droplets on the surface, fomites, non living objects, that's indirect transmission. But yeah, good. Any questions? All right, what I'll get you all to do now, feel free to take a five minute break and then we'll recap and we'll run through uh, your ecto. Have we gone through ectoparasites, everyone? No? We classified. Okay, we'll go through that when we come back. Okay? And also fungi as well. All right, so feel free to go outside and um, get some fresh air if you'd like as well. Um, look at the question. Uh, yeah, um, with prions, yeah. you said that if you scroll up, you wrote that you can be indirectly um, consumed, but I mean, sorry, you, you said it, was, it can be directly consumed, but isn't ingestion indirect? This is the other thing, it depends what you're ingesting, right? If you're ingesting beef or cooked meat, for example, that's technically, well, the cattle is an organism that had prior disease, so consuming that is technically direct. Um, and then if it's a individual, say cannibalism, that is also direct, because it is direct contact with an infected organism, right? So I'd say both consumption is direct. But I think, look, what you're confusing is fecal oral transmission. Yeah. So, so uh, that is indirect because the actual food originally was not the organism that had the fecal oral bacteria. It's contamination from dirty hands, etc. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, we'll yeah. go through transmission. I know it's a little bit complicated because it really depends on, you know, the specific scenario. But uh, I'll give you guys the key things to remember when we talk about transmission. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah, 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 sure. There you go. No worries.
All right. All right, we're back. Safi, do you have a question? Um, I just want to ask that um, I still don't have access to the resource. I oh, messaged okay. admin. Okay. Oh, I think, yeah. So I think the thing is admin's got COVID. When did you message? Um, she asked yesterday, I think. Yeah, so she'll give you access later today. All Quite right. well at the moment, but um, um, yeah, did you give your email? Yeah, I did. Okay, so once she replies, she definitely will give you access. Okay, if not, message me directly if it's not there by the end of today. All right, thank you. No worries. All right, cool. All right, so we've spoken about bacteria. We've spoken about viruses, prions, and even protozoa. I guess the key thing you need to know about protozoa, going down to the protozoa section, all the way here, is that protozoa are unicellular eukaryotic, Unicellular eukaryotic. You can use a C or a K, anything works. Uh, but they don't have a cell wall. That's a key thing. No cell wall. How do we fight something that looks just like us? Anyone? This cell looks a lot like the human cells, right? For a bacteria, we fought them because we knew bacteria had a cell wall, so we created drugs that accumulate and destroy the cell wall. Uh, for viruses, we found out viruses have special enzymes that humans don't have. So we created drugs that bind to those enzymes, destroy them. Now, when it comes to protozoa, they look just like us. They're eukaryotic, they're cellular. How do we fight them? And this is to highlight there are two ways of problem solving, right? There's deductive and inductive problem solving. Has anyone heard of these terms before? Okay, I want you to research and find what, what this means, because this is what school should be teaching you, how to be a problem solver. Inductive and deductive reasoning. This will frame how to think about things. Maybe I can explain to you at the end of today. But one way, as you all know, is to look at the theory then devise a probable hypothesis that can solve a problem, test it with experiments, and see if you get the result you want. Does that make sense? The other way of problem solving is working backwards, right? Trialing a bunch of random things and using them to create hypotheses. It was weird. In, you know, about hundreds of years ago, uh, the, I think it was the American Indians, but they rubbed a tree bark on their skin to repel against malaria. And we isolated the ingredient, which is hydroxychloroquine. And that's one of the main treatments today for malaria. So we actually used their logical, just random, you know, they didn't know any, anything about protozoa or what causes malaria. They just tried different things and they figured some things worked. And then we worked backwards to find out what drug works. So a lot of, not just medicine, but a lot of fields work in those ways. So that's how you can start problem solving. Good. So key thing here is the drugs, they target specific chemicals in these protozoa. We don't need to know what they are, but I guess the key thing is malaria is the one protozoa caused by the plasmodium protozoan that you must remember. Plasmodium protozoan causes malaria. We'll talk about treatments when we get to treatments. Okay, that was just a bit of an explanation of how to think in medicine and health. Good. Happy to move on? Good. How are they transmitted? Well, how is malaria transmitted, everyone? Vector. Now, there is a specific vector. It's not just any mosquito, and you need to know this. For malaria, it's pregnant mosquitoes, weirdly enough. It's female mosquitoes, female Anopheles mosquitoes. Female Anopheles mosquitoes. Anopheles is a type of mosquito. Now, it doesn't, the mosquito doesn't have to be pregnant, but it's only the female that can carry the plasmodium protozoan in their digestive system. Does that make sense? Good, so not any mosquito can give you malaria. It's a vector transmission. Very good. 
These are like aliens, right? This is electron microscopy of, I believe this is Giardia, which is another protozoa that infects humans, but it causes gastroenteritis, causes a watery diarrhea. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Now, plant diseases, I want you to study that yourself. But all, all you need to know is what key patterns of disease you notice for the different plant pathogens. So when it comes to plants, how do you know if something is viral? How do you know if something is bacterial? And how do you know if something is fungal? I don't care about this stuff, but the reason I still think it's interesting is because this gives you a little bit of a window into how humans are affected by these diseases as well. When you study how plants respond and are affected, you get a better understanding of how and why humans are also affected. So what's a sign of a viral plant infection? Discoloration. The key word I'm looking for is mosaicism, right? I'm looking for, what is a mosaic pattern? I kind of gave it away. A mosaic is a pattern of different colors, typically. You see that in a mosaic, right? Um, that's why the fluid mosaic model is how we describe the phospholipid bilayers. Different parts of that phospholipid bilayer, including phospholipids, proteins, carbohydrates that were repeating themselves, right? So a mosaic is a repeating pattern. So in plants, you see repeating patterns of discoloration, right? Typically lighter discoloration. That's a sign of a viral infection. Let me show an image because words don't mean anything if you don't study what you're talking about. Can you all just quickly search up plant mosaic infection? I'll search it up as well. Plant mosaic. Or plant mosaicism. Yeah, and you'll see plants that You've seen this so many times, right? Plants that have these little patches of, you know, lighter green and darker green throughout. It's very common. So that's a sign of viral infection. What about bacterial infection? Think about acne. What are some signs of acne? Pus formation, discharge release, right? The same thing with bacterial infections because acne is a bacterial infection of the skin. Bacterial infections on the surface or skin of the plants have a very similar effect. They're going to be resulting in discharge. What's another feature of bacterial plant diseases? I remember bacteria have a B, B for blight. Does anyone know what blight is? It's browning of the leaf. The leaf is browning prematurely inside a bacterial infection too. What about fungi? What are some signs of fungal infection? Lookman, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, would galls be one, like swelling? Yeah, it's another really good one, right? So galls, they occur when bacteria, they irritate cells and they release chemicals that increase replication in cells. This is only for plants. Bacteria do not cause tumors in humans, right? Only in plants. Certain plant bacteria release chemicals that increase plant cell mitosis and that produces big tumors on plants. If you just get your phone again, you search GAL, back the images, but G A W L. You've got to see this stuff. Same thing with medicine. The best way to study medicine is seeing patients who are sick with the disease and you never forget. I'm sure everyone's seen gals before. Have you seen this before in a plant? D A W L. Has everyone seen those before? Yeah, there's gals on the behind of on the behind of leaves. Little little tumors or goats. I used to pick at them when I used to pull leaves from plants and then play with it. And I remember I pick at little tumors on it. Good. Fungi. Are two things we're looking for. It's the same thing with humans. So viral diseases in humans, if they affect the skin, it typically causes a pattern of disease, right? An example is shingles. Has anyone heard of shingles before? You get this eruption of red uh, vesicles in this very clean pattern on the skin. Bacterial infections, you typically see pus. If you ever see pus oozing out of a wound, it's bacterially infected. 
Ponga, what do we notice? Ponga? Two things I want you to say. What is rust? No? Orangey or orange slash browning of a particular material, right? When metals react with oxygen, they typically will rust, right? Now, when we say rust is a disease, we're talking about that color change, but with leaves. Leaves can rust or become orange out. That's typically caused by fungi as well. So you can search wheat rust, for example, and you will see uh, leaves that are kind of orange slash browning. Both side of fungal infection. Mildew is white powder on a leaf. White powder. Now, this is the most important because fungal infections make up 80% of plant infections. It's super high yield. Does that make sense? Super high yield. Exactly like that, but not seasonal, right? So you would see that autumn is, is not just rusting in leaves. There's a lot of things that happen. Leaves shed more, etc. as well. It's a seasonal pattern. Uh, with fungal infections, if you search rust, it occurs in patches. It looks very pathological and non-physiological. Uh, I mean, plant rust. <laughs> Yeah, so it doesn't occur symmetrically, the whole leaf doesn't brown, it occurs in patches, it looks like a skin condition. Yeah. Good. Yeah, um, see, I'm not sure how it produces all these different phenomena, but it can, it's the same as humans, right? The phenomena of its change can be attributed to either the pathogen or the organism response to the pathogen. I'm not sure which one it is that causes rust. I'm guessing it's to do with decreasing chlorophyll production, right? And that can be secondary to acute stress by the plant due to fungi. But uh, I'm not sure of the specifics. All right. Yeah, the key thing is for plants, you just need to recognize the pattern of disease. Okay? And maybe you know one pathogen that causes viral, bacteria, and fungal plant disease. It's all in your notes. Um, apart from that, you don't need to know anything else. Good. What about fungi? What's the structure of a fungi, Tanisha? What is it? Like? The structure? Yeah. Um, eukaryotic or pro? It can be either. Only eukaryotic. Only you. I want you guys to all remember this. What is the only prokaryotic organism? Bacteria. Right, only bacteria. There's archaea as well, but they don't cause disease. So in this module, all intents and purposes, only prokaryotic organism is bacteria. Make sense? Everything else is eukaryotic. Good. Victoria, what's another feature of fungi? What else do fungi have? Do they have a cell wall or no cell wall? Um, no cell wall. Is it no cell wall? Close. Fungi do have a cell wall. And it's made out of chitin. It's a weird protein-like material called chitin. So they also have a cell wall. Okay. I know this can get confusing because you're like, okay, well, I learned that protozoa don't have a cell wall, but fungi do, but bacteria do. The way I would revise this is look at images of these organisms, do exam questions, right? I remember bacteria have a cell wall because antibiotics destroy this. And then the fungi have a cell wall because the word chitin, I don't know, I just don't forget it. It's a weird, weird name to do with fungi. Good. How do they reproduce? It's a mechanism of reproduction of fungi. Good. Spore formation. What's another one? Good. They will ask you that because it. They can test more information in the same question. They make mod 5 to mod, mod 7 in this way. Good. All right, let's move on. You should know examples of fungal diseases. Does anyone know any examples? This is one you should know. Thrush. It's a very interesting one. 
thrush is caused by a bacteria. The formal name for thrush is can candidiasis, but it's caused by a bac not a bacteria, a fungi known as Candida albicans. And you don't need to know the name of these organisms. Um, don't search it up. You can go home and search it up if you want to. It looks really nasty. If you've seen cottage cheese, that's how we describe it. It looks like a cottage cheese discharge. It occurs in the mouth of babies. It can occur in the vaginal canal of pregnant women. Very common. About half a pregnant woman will get it at some point in the time. And the other population that gets thrush is immunocompromised people. So what does it tell you about thrush? Is it a high virulence disease or is it an opportunistic infection? Opportunistic. So in pregnancy, there's hormonal changes, bacterial changes due to those hormones. Thus, thrush happens. In babies, they don't have a functional immune system because they relied on mum through pregnancy and mum's antibodies and her immune system. And so babies commonly get it as well. Okay, and the third portion is HIV patients. You should always look at the mouth to look for any infection and thrush. Weird thing is HIV patients will get inflammation, not just to the mouth, the entire throat. It's called esophagitis. It's quite nasty. All right, let's move on. Uh, here you go. Here's your question about the iron transmission. What's your answer? And can you tell me why do we still not have a cure for prions in 2022? What's the rationale for that? Any ideas? You guys should be asking me these questions, right? Why do we still not have a cure for this nasty disease that causes symptoms like dementia? I think that one of the worst ways to die is, is never being able to sleep. Fatal familial insomnia is a prior disease that does just that. Lookman, any ideas? Uh, yeah, because <laughs> it's located in like really valuable areas like the brain. So if we attempt to get rid of that, we can affect it. Very good, right? So that's one rationale. The brain is very delicate, right? Any radiation, any uh, chemotherapy, any damage to the brain, um, trying to destroy proteins is going to obviously destroy neurons, which are delicate cells, right? Proteins are not even living. If we need to destroy a protein, we need a lot of radiation, a lot of heat that will demolish all the surrounding cells. So I'd say that's the main reason. Uh, it's in a very delicate environment and proteins are irresistible. They're not even living. How do you destroy them, right? Good. Let's move on. Pardon? Oh, yes, sorry, I completely missed that. You tell me. You tell me. Uh, yeah. 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 Why is it not C, everyone? Droplet transmission is not right. Why is it not B? Uh, I'd say indirect contact is vague because we said directly consuming prior protein is also one mode of transmission. And fecal oral is not right, because we'll come back to this, but what is the difference between consuming infected food and fecal oral transmission? You shouldn't mix those up. So infected food is, for example, cannibalism, right? Eating infected prior to you. Why do we not call that fecal oral? After digestion, it's caused by the body. Uh, see, the thing, what fecal oral literally means is fecal organisms, so organisms typically found in fecal matter, have somehow found their way on food, right? Or gone to the oral cavity, food or water. Those are two things that enter the oral cavity, right? So fecal bacteria or fecal viruses or fecal protozoa have entered food or water, and then they've gone to the oral cavity. Do you see how the food originally was fine? 
but then the fecal pathogen is then laced on that. That's fecal oral transmission. So you go to, for example, India, the water sources you can't drink out of them because it's got cholera, which is a really nasty bacteria. But water is, doesn't always have cholera. Does that make sense? Whereas cannibalism, right, the organism always had that prior disease. It was present, right? So when you ingest it, you're directly consuming an infected organism with prior disease. You see the difference there? Yeah? Good. So fecal oral is... So every time you've had a stomach bug, what's happened is poor hygiene practices. Right? Somehow fecal bacteria has entered food or water. Good. Right. Is indirect? Yeah, you're completely right. So surgical equipment is indirect. Then the question is, but what's the best answer? Right? So I would say look, these are both quite decent answers, but there are entire prior diseases which are characterized on direct contact. Right? So uh, Ku is a clear, clear example of that. So it's a direct contact. This is a difficult question. I'd say it's iffy, and you could definitely argue this is also right because of contaminated surgical equipment, etc. But I'd say pick the best answer when it's tough. Just have 10 seconds. What is the causative organism? What is the causative pathogen here, or the causative organism? Patient is dying, the blood pressure is dropping. What medication are you giving them? Antibiotic, antifungal? Patient is dead, they are flatlined. You're giving them antibiotic, they're dying. What are you giving them? They died. What are you giving them? Not sure they've died. What about you? Good, you saved the patient's life. This is a eukaryotic cell. It's got mitochondria. Why would it be a bacteria? The first question you ask yourself when you're identifying cell type is, is it prokaryotic or is it eukaryotic? Does that make sense? If it's prokaryotic, what does it have to be? Right, so just right back here. If it's eukaryotic, that takes you to question two. What do you want to ask yourself? That's it, it's that easy. Is there a cell wall? If the answer is yes, what's your answer? The answer is no, what's your answer? That's how easy this is. Okay, there you go, you've created your own flow chart. Don't memorize this flow chart, use your logic. Okay, I just memorize the questions. You need to memorize it. These are the two most important things you need to know about structure. Prokaryotic or eukaryotic, cell wall or no cell wall. All right, you can do the rest of that question later. Let's move on. All right, so we haven't spoken about endoerectal parasites. I have even mentioned examples of them. Okay. All right, let's talk about them. So far, everyone, we have been talking about microparasites. You might be thinking, wait, a bacteria is a parasite? What does it need to be a parasite? It's a relationship, it describes a relationship where one organism is being harmed and what's happened to the other organism? It's benefited. So technically, every pathogen is also a parasite. Just interchangeable terms, pretty much. Whereas parasite is stressing the relationship it has, pathogen is explaining the cause of the disease. Okay, just parasite is benefited. Sorry, repeat that, kid. Parasite. I would say it can, but you're stressing two different things. It's like saying uh, bipedal sapien versus uh, human being. Right. You're emphasizing humanity versus the biologic mechanics in one, right? So I'd say don't replace pathogen with parasite. I wouldn't even use the word parasite in your exams unless you're talking about macro parasites, okay? But I'm just identifying technically all of these are parasites. You might see that in your book somewhere, okay? So in your head, pathogen, 
they can be divided into non-cellular or cellular. Make sense? When they're cellular, they can be divided into micro and they can be divided into macro. You can see it. Good. So far, we've gone through micro and non-cellular. Non-cellular is your prions. What else is non-cellular? Virus. Very good. And Georgina, what are some examples of microorganisms that are pathogens? We've just gone through a couple of them. What are some examples of some microorganisms? Come on, quickly. Guy here? Um, bacteria, fungi, protozoa. What was the other one? Bacteria, fungi, we're missing one in between. And protozoa. Very good, protozoa. Good. So now we're going to be talking about macro. This is very important. Because you need to know how to think in biology. I don't care if you memorize the nitty gritty details. I care if you finish E12 and now you have the cement that you can add on any scientific knowledge, whatever you want to do, right? Whether it's aerospace or um, theoretical physics, etc. How to think is way more important than what to think. With macro, how can we break it down? Good. Inside the body, which is endo, and outside the body, I get. You would use exo, which is the terminology we use in this case is ecto. Okay? Very good. So endo or ecto. What is the commonality of endoparasites? What do they all want? All have one goal. Yeah, the goal is they need uh, not endoparasites, your ectoparasites need blood. Because that is the only nutrient they can access from the outside, if you think about this. Everything else, your glucose is all deeper inside the body, right? It's also in the blood as well. Endoparasites contain any nutrient, right? They contain glucose, they contain protein, depending on whichever body or organ they're in. Okay? Now, your endoparasites are your worms, all the different worm like organisms. Now, the worm like organism, the name of the family is helminths. If you guys ever see the word helminth, it means worm like organism. Did anyone watch those documentaries where it would be like, man returns from a camping trip, he dies three days later, and then they take you through the case, and it's like a nasty worm found in the water in that tropical area. Did you guys ever watch those documentaries? Yeah? No, not really. Maybe it was the early 2000s thing. I don't know. But um, those are very intriguing for me. Helmets are quite interesting as part of it. And then ecto, what are some examples of ectoparasites? Pardon? Yeah. Lice, ticks, mites, fleas. Those are some examples. Okay? Now you just have to know one example of each. Pick one. Now I'm going to show you. I like going through this one. Have I shown you this image before? All right. What do you think is going on with this person? What body system is affected? This is, this is a cool part about medicine, right? You have to be a detective. You're like Sherlock Holmes for the human body. Can anyone describe what's happening? Okay. It could be inflammation, but do you see? Do you see? Do you see any redness? No. Good. So I'd say it doesn't look like a clear inflammatory process because if it was this swollen, I'd expect to see a lot of redness and inflammation, right? So it doesn't look significantly inflamed, but it looks like there's a lot of fluid buildup. Where is most of the fluid in your body? The large portion in cells, there's a portion outside of cells, there's about five to six liters in the blood. Now, what happens is, all the time, fluid or plasma, which is a watery component of blood, leaves blood vessels and then returns back into the bloodstream. What is that system of vessels that travels with the blood that will return fluid from tissue into the bloodstream? Arteries are the blood vessels, but I'm asking you, right next to blood vessels, so this is a blood vessel, 
He told us that every day, three to four liters of fluid moves out of the blood into tissue, and it needs to move back into blood. What is the other vessel that travels with blood and is going to return fluid that's in tissue back into the bloodstream? Lymph system. Guy, could you repeat that, Gaiathri? Yeah, is it lymph, lymphatic system? Very good, the lymphatic system. A lot of people don't know. I didn't even know what the lymphatic system was until year 12. Like, I didn't even know the whole body system, which whole function, on top of many other things, is to return fluid from your tissues into your blood. I'll give you an example. If you imagine, if, I, if you put your thumb out, right? If I got a hammer, I'm not going to do this, but if I smashed your thumb, what would happen? Red, hot, swollen. That's because fluid has moved out of the blood and recruited white cells in that fluid to fight whatever infection or injury is there. But eventually what happens to that swollen thumb? It becomes normal. Why does it become normal? All that fluid gets returned into the bloodstream by this system. So if you block this system, what would happen? Thumb would be swollen, swollen, swollen. That's what's happened here. So using my detective knowledge of the body, I now know this is infection like the lymphatic system. And this is a worm infection caused by the filarial worm of the lymphatic system. You can just remember this. It kind of looks like elephant trunk feet, right? So the disease is also called elephantiasis, caused by this worm. Okay. Good. I use an image because now you're never going to forget your exam, right? If you forget everything, just remember elephant feet, elephant geosis. Okay? Let's move on. Now, this is something I'm going to get you to search up, but I'm going to first screen the search results so you don't get traumatized. This is not bad. Can you all search up Scabies, S-C-A-B-I-E-S, -E Scabies. Uh, it's here. Scabies? Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right. All right, has everyone seen that? Now, this is caused by a mite, and the name of this mite is Sarcoptus scaby. You don't need to know the name again. Like I said, you only need to know names of diseases and knowing the general causative agent. Is it a bacteria, virus, etc.? You don't need to know the names. But Sarcoptus scaby is this mite that burrows into the skin and causes those little wounds. Now, for the next search, I'm pre warning you, you are. You don't like seeing blood, gory images, human tissue, etc. Probably don't search this up. Maybe search it up after class. But if you search severe crusting scabies, this is a form of scabies which is so severe, it typically occurs in immunocompromised people, but it looks, the skin can turn black, it can immediately crust, and there can be huge wounds in the body. Now, you might think, you know, I've never seen this, so it's rare. But a lot of indigenous rural communities are infected by it. Now, the treatment is very simple. The treatment is using anti, you know, parasitic agents. Has anyone heard of ivermectin before? No? You guys didn't hear about the news where people were, I think, ingesting ivermectin for COVID? All kinds of weird stuff people are doing. But ivermectin is used to treat this fungal scabies infection. Now, I told you the treatment is very easy. Right? But this disease is so prevalent, it's transmitted by sharing beds, sofas, you know, if someone's bed sheets have scabies, you will get it. How can we treat scabies in the indigenous communities? Because children get severe scabies to the point where they're bleeding, it's got huge wounds in their body. It's very preventable. What do you think we can do? What's a solution to that problem? Okay, possibly, yeah. Um, I would say vaccines are not too effective because it takes time for your body to respond to the pathogen. And scabies, uh, it's, 
It's different to a bacteria. Bacteria slows, you know, they spread in the whole human body, etc. These mites can quickly cause lesions. It will take some days to get rid of it as well. So we don't have a clear vaccine. The ector, because these are mites, so mites are worms. Ector. These mites are all ecto. What's the solution? Here it is. So one solution that was proposed is we build swimming pools in these rural indigenous communities, and in the water you use ivermectin. That way kids are encouraged to swim, use the water, but the ivermectin in a pool will kill the mites and scabies. That's a really good way of bringing uptake and also curing and preventing this disease occurring. The reason I mention this is, does anyone know what the biggest, I guess, characteristic of a person for success is? So look around you, look at you. What quality do you think is the most predictive of success in someone's life? When I mean success, I mean doing really well in life. I'm not just talking stable income, that kind of stuff. Doing really well. What would you say the main characteristic is? We'll ask for online students as well. Any ideas? Discipline. Discipline? Yeah. That's good. Discipline is good for getting good at something. Yeah, I'd say to do good in the HSC, that dis takes discipline. Where right, you got to sit down and don't want to do work. Anything else? Application. Application, getting there. Right, people who are applying their knowledge. That's a whole different game versus just memorizing to get marks, right? That's probably the worst thing you can do. Because then you cap yourself in your potential. What else? Curiosity. I'd say we're really getting application curiosity. I would say it's problem solving and self directedness. Right? People that use this information and think, where in the world can I apply it and solve a pressing issue? And if you look at everything around you and you're more perceptive, I've noticed people do way, way better at life. Give you a small example, right? I have a peer of mine who's a medical student. He's self directed, so he taught himself code. He's quite good at it. In the hospital system, you'd be surprised to know since 2022, certain hospitals still use paper records, right? They still write on pen and paper. You think about the amount of medical errors that occur from handwriting, from forgetting what files are, patient information. So, what he's now doing is he's got multi million dollar funding from the government to help in developing the medical record system for New South Wales. This is a multi-millionaire medical student who simply just saw a problem in the community and tried to solve it. So I encourage you all to look around you and try finding problems to solve and building a skill set so one day when you, that problem comes knocking at you, you can solve it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what I've noticed is a key skill for success in life. All right, we've got about four minutes. We've gone through ecto endoparasites. Plant infections, I just want you to have a read of this section. It's very similar key points. There are certain worms or helmets that affect plants. You can see a citrus leaf miner. This is the worm on the underside of the plant leaf, right? And there are certain nematodes. This is another helmet or worm-like pathogen. Nematode, I'm just going to write helmet. But these are the eggs at the root of the nematode infection, okay? Don't memorize these parasitic infections. I've never ever in the HC or even trials seen them ever ask for a named example of a plant parasite infection. One thing you should know though is fungal infections. Is everyone with me? Plant fungal infections, you must know an example and you must know the causative agent as well. Okay? All right, this is literally what I just taught you, this big flow chart here. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions about pathogens, ecto, endo, parasites, any of that stuff? No questions at all? Okay, good. I think that's going to take us to our next question, which is transmission. Before we go through that, We briefly spoke about direct, indirect, and vector transmission. Who wants to define it for me again? Cushing? Yeah. 
What is direct transmission? What's indirect? Direct is like when it's like two people, like visible contact. Okay. And indirect is like, like not that. Basically, it's like when it's like two people, like mainly through the like the touch surfaces. So I want you to remember this. It's physical contact or secretions, right? It can be coughing, sneezing, any droplets that directly go from one person to another is direct contact. Does that make sense? So either directly touching someone and then them entering that into their body cavity or secretions going from person A to person B. Okay, what is indirect then? It's everything else, right? There is no direct contact or there are secretions that haven't directly transferred from person one to person two. Good. Now, I'm going to give you all about a minute. I want you to start telling me some examples of direct and indirect contact. I'm going to list some for you. Fecal oral, uh, sexual transmission, uh, hematogenous, airborne, mosquitoes, Infected animals. You notice this. So you all have about 30 seconds to quickly tell me. Oh. Uh, zoonosis or infected animals. Zoo animal. Zoonosis is animal transmission. Okay, yeah, that's zoonosis. Zoonosis. Good. Excuse me, sir. Yeah? Uh, what's the activity? Like, what do you want us to do? I want you to classify this as direct oh, and right. direct all of these categories. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask people. So, what is hematosis? is blood. Yeah, blood bone transmission. Okay. Is this to teach you that some of these categories are both direct or indirect depending on the circumstance? Right? Just that's one of the key things to remember. All right, let's start with fecal oral. What is fecal oral? So you remember, all this is written in your notes. We'll go through this next lesson as well. Start with disease transmission. But what is fecal oral? What is it that organism that usually resides on the fecal matter? Yeah. Um, that ends up on the Good, right? It doesn't even have to be food. Any medium that can enter the mouth. So food or water, right? And uh, good. So is that direct or indirect? That would be indirect, right? Because the fecal bacteria from organism one doesn't directly go to organism two. It always moves through some kind of medium, food or water. Does that make sense? That is the majority of the time. What about sexual transmission? So let's write for direct contact. Uh, for indirect, is fecal oral. Okay, uh, what about sexual transmission? Direct, right? Sexual transmission needs uh, the direct contact of mucosa from the reproductive cavity of um, the female and the reproductive tract of the male, right? Mucosa means, you guys see how the lips, they dry on the outside, but the second you go closer in with it becomes moist, right? With fluid, that's mucosa. So the inside of your nose, your mouth, your throat, where it's uh, slide in water. That is mucosa. And that includes the reproductive system as well. So sexual transmission right, is direct because you need contact of two people's mucosa with each other. Good. Uh, what about... I have a question. Can you transmit diseases by kissing? Which disease is HIV? No. Pardon? Very good. I'm surprised you know that meningococcal is really nasty. It's a type of uh, meningitis caused by Neisseria meningitis. What that means is it's a bacterial meningitis. And that can occur in your age group. It's commonly occurring in your or my age group. And people either get an amputation or they die within a couple of days. It's a really, really nasty disease. The reason is the bacteria goes from the mouth okay, to the brain. And it quickly goes from the brain to the blood. In the blood, it's going to drop your blood pressure. And what happens when you drop blood pressure to organs? 
when the blood goes down, the organs become black or necrotic, they become skin, when they lose oxygen, right? And all those things result in organ failure, the need for amputation, or even death. You can, you can search meningococcal, it's one of those scariest diseases for young people. Good, so I'd say yes. Anyway, fecal oral, sexual we said was direct, hematogenous, primarily direct or indirect? Think about this, if something is, be, is going to be blood borne, yeah, it's mainly needles in today's society, right? No one gets a cut and rubs it on someone else's cut, it's very rare. If that happened, it would be direct. So what I mean, uh, so hematogenous is more indirect, and it's due to needles that are shared between individuals nowadays, right? or even transfusions, uh, etc. Blood products. Hematogenous is blood transfusion, a blood transmission. Okay. What about airborne? It was direct touch or secretions. For something to be airborne, the droplet is so small that it vaporizes and only the pathogen is floating in the air. The secretion is gone and the pathogen floats to person two. Since there is no secretion or direct touch, what do we call that? Indirect. Good. And finally, infected animals, they bite you, they scratch you, direct. Rabies, clear example of direct, okay? It can be indirect, infected animal poop that's left over, and then that can be a risk of transmission. Um, yeah, that's it. Good job. We'll come back to this next lesson, okay? But you're free to go now. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you.